who wants nature um, uh, that Kane is, uh, Kane's submissions <laughs> are likely to be. And, um, and, and so they've always been available. But what's happened online is that councils are making this all available and it's far easier to get access to it as opposed to trotting down to the council and getting a copy of it. But it is, in fact, an application of the Local Government Official Information and Meetings Act. Now, you can request for your contact details not to be published online ah. at those organisations, but they tend to take them... Um, they tend to be for people who have got protection orders or a note from the police or something oh, okay. that says that um, they, these shouldn't be published online. They'll still identify people, but they'll be careful about um, uh, publishing their contact details, particularly a physical address, when there are protections in place. Um, otherwise, essentially we're just saying to people that if you want to be kept in the loop about all the submissions that are being made and being included, then this is what we need. But we're losing voices. Well, if you believe Kane, we've lost his voice over two matters, uh, two representations. So are we losing voices? Well, I hope not. And what I, I would say to Kane is, first of all, keep at it. Just because somebody disagrees with your opinion and writes you an appalling email, keep at it. Hold firm to your opinion, Kane, um, because they are learned and nuanced. And, and our councils need to hear from people like you. Um, and even if they're not, don't go, just go for it. But the second thing is that if somebody is victimising you through emails, then you can contact the police because that's unacceptable under our, um, uh, our legislation on harmful digital communications. And if it's getting to the point where you seriously withdraw a submission because you feel threatened, give the police a ring. OK. Just before you go, Kane's other suggestion, Catherine, is that he fiddles with his personal contact details a bit to disguise himself. Um, can he do this with any impunity or not? No, no, no. He, there's a little thing called fraud that we don't like. Um, <laughs> so, so, so if Kane could not do that, that would be great. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Catherine Dale South, thank you for joining us on the panel. We just won gold and silver in the mountain biking at the Games. Excellent. Yeah, isn't Excellent. That good? Gold and silver. New, uh, before we go, Auckland house prices... No longer among the fastest rising in the world, in fact. A report out today on one of the big media platforms says and the city's barely in the top 100 now of growth. The prices are still high, but in terms of growth anymore. But Trade Me says property prices in the capital have surged to record highs. And so, for example, the average price for houses with at least five bedrooms in the Wellington region, admittedly not in everybody's cup of tea, but they've reached a record high of a million dollars and six thousand, million and six thousand dollars in the Trade Me property price index. Have you uh, hankered to live in Wellington? I know you drive there. Andrew, have you ever hankered to live there? Uh, not really. I mean, w I was born and raised just north of Upper Hutt, so spent the first 20-odd years of my life down here. Um, no, I was quite glad uh, when we decided to purchase a farm up in the Manor Two to get out of the big smoke and get a bit more rural. OK, you're a country boy. Yep. Lisa? Mm. Oh, Lisa, yes, you, I love, you've done I a bit love of that Wellington. Yourself. I love Wellington and I would love to live there. It's a great city and Wellingtonians are the kind of people I would love to rub shoulders with. They're so cool. You must have a lot of readers in Wellington, do you? Just, I'm, <laughs> I'm just <joking>. sure. <laughs> <laughs> Strong Wellington readership. <laughs> the time I spend there, it's just, there's everything there that you could possibly want in a little <laughs> city and it's just so perfect. Yeah, if I, I had it. to have a, if I had to be in a city, it would be Wellington though. Oh, yeah. that's, we're ending on a very positive note. <laughs> um, Andrew Hoggart, thank you for your company today. No worries. Safe drive home. And yep. Lisa Scott, lovely to talk to you as well. Oh, it's great to talk to you. Sorry about the croaking. And good luck with the book. Uh, Thank that's you. us. We're back tomorrow. Thanks, everybody. And checkpoints coming right up. Koeti Maira e Hoama, he Korero, Kate Hairi, he Kopapa, Kate Karafio. Tonight on Checkpoint just happened. Sam Gaze has taken gold and Anton Cooper silver in the mountain biking at the Commonwealth Games. Remarkably, that switches their medal positions from four years ago in Glasgow. Uh, we'll have more on that in a sec. The government announces no future oil and gas exploration, although 57 existing permits stand. We go to Taranaki, we hear from the industry, from environmentalists and from politicians for, against and maybe dutifully biting their tongue. 35,000 homes and businesses still without power in Auckland and more wild winds are on the way. We talk to nurses about their pay round, Syria, the Algerian plane crash and much more coming up after the news.
RNZ News at five. Kia ora, good afternoon. Ko Katrina Batten, aho. A 13-floor commercial office building in central Wellington was abruptly evacuated this afternoon. At about two o'clock, all occupants of 79 Bullcott Street were given two hours to get out. The evacuation order was issued after engineers deemed the building unsafe to occupy because of cracks in the floor. Tenants had to rush to remove computers, paperwork and other items from their offices. Phil Guerin of Haig Consulting on the third floor says he understands the cracks may have been there since the tower block was built and strengthening work was about to begin. I think the building's well built and the property managers have been informing us along the way of everything that's happened and uh, they just did a little more due diligence and found something they weren't expecting so um, I think they're, they're being better safe than sorry, I hope so. I'd like to come back to the building. <laughs> a Wellington office worker, Phil Guerin. The senior cabinet minister Andrew Little has been dispatched to Taranaki to front a public meeting over the government's decision to end offshore oil and gas exploration. The Prime Minister announced early today that no new offshore oil and gas permits will be granted. And although onshore block offers will continue in Taranaki for the next three years, they'll be reviewed after that. The Mayor of New Plymouth has described the move as a kick in the guts and the Chief Executive of the Taranaki Chamber of Commerce, Aaron Chowdhury, says the region's business leaders have been blindsided by it. Two weeks ago at the Petroleum Conference, the Minister clearly announced, Minister Woods, that there would be a consultation process with all stakeholders. Uh, the Taranaki business community is a major stakeholder and we feel that we haven't had the opportunity to consult. Aaron Chowdhury. The Regional Economic Development Minister Shane Jones admits he's a pro-industry man but says he must support the government's move. I can't walk back from the status that I've had throughout my whole life as being a pro-industry man but I am one person and I am loyal to the agreements that are struck by my leader and the Prime Minister and it's futile to talk about alternative scenarios. The Regional Development Minister Shane Jones. Vector says there could be delays in getting power restored to tens of thousands of Aucklanders because another storm is coming. About 32,000 Aucklanders are still without power since high winds and fallen trees took out lines on Tuesday night. More damaging winds and possible tornadoes are forecast tonight, particularly for the city's west. But Victor's, uh, Victor's network program delivery manager, Minoru Fredrickson's, says it will probably need to stand crews down for their safety. That might just impact the number of people we can get up, get back on before then. And unfortunately, you know, it may result of you know, some weakened trees going down and we might end up with some more outages or people having repeat outages. Minoru Fredrickson's of Vector. At the Commonwealth Games, the New Zealand mountain bikers Sam Gaze and Anton Cooper have just won gold and silver respectively in the final. There will be more on the Games in sports news shortly. Nurses are to be balloted about strike action. That's despite them agreeing today to an independent panel as a way of resolving their pay row. Our health correspondent Karen Brown has more. The nurses' organisation says it'll go ahead with a three-person panel, members of which are expected to be announced early next week. The union says the panel will take three to four weeks to hear submissions before making final recommendations. It says district health board employers would then be required to update their pay offer, which nurses would vote on, but in the meantime they will also have been balloted over strike action. The union says that's needed in case the panel doesn't come up with a suitable result. Ko Karen Brownahoe. The Education Ministry upheld a record number of complaints against early childhood services in 2016 and shut down 23 centres. Its latest complaint summary shows it found evidence of problems like abuse of children, poor health and safety and failure to meet licensing standards. Our education correspondent John Gerritsen reports. The Ministry received 331 complaints in 2016, about the same number as in 2015, but it upheld a lot more of them, 163 in total. It closed or put licensing conditions on 47 centres, four times as many as in 2015. Many of the upheld complaints involved health and safety or management and administration problems. The Ministry also upheld 12 complaints about physical or emotional injuries to children, 12 of inappropriate staff behaviour and 8 of centres operating with too few staff. The Ministry says 24 of the complaints resulted in staff leaving the early childhood service. Call John Gerritsen, TNA. It's five minutes past five. 
To sport, and Valerie Adams has shown she's the leading shot put gold medal candidate at the Commonwealth Games with the best qualifying throw today. She threw more than a metre further than her nearest rival to easily go through to tomorrow night's final. The New Zealand para lawn bowls triple won silver after losing to Australia in their final. And earlier today, women's mountain biker Samara Shepard finished ninth after an early puncture. But 800 metre runner Angie Petty missed the final of her event by finishing fifth in her heat. The Chiefs are yet to decide whether or not Damien McKenzie, who injured his hip last week, will feature against the Hurricanes tomorrow night. Assistant coach Neil Barnes says he can't deny that McKenzie is key for the side, but believes they have enough depth to cover his potential absence. Can't hide from the fact they're both outstanding players, but they're one cog in a wheel, and we're back from that person to step in. As we've shown all year, we've got a lot of people out at the moment, but the people in mind have been working hard and know the structures have stepped up and done the job well. So it's going to have some impact, but we're still back the next people coming in from behind. Chiefs assistant coach Neil Barnes. And New Zealand basketball star Stephen Adams side, the Oklahoma City Thunder have closed out the NBA regular season with a 137 to 123 win over the Memphis Grizzlies. The Thunder will play the Utah Jazz in the first round of playoffs. That's the news. Fiji's killer storm. Power is still out here. Hotels are running on generators. Water's having to be boiled and people are really busy clearing out all the sludge and rubbish from their homes and villages. Auckland outages. Obviously also have to manage the safety of the crews and in particular manage the fatigue. That's what happens after such a ferocious hurricane level type of storm. Coping in chaos. We just uh, cake prod to uh, hold our bread and let the gas and turn the old store style. Current affairs covered. Morning Report with Guy and Espiner and Susie Ferguson weekdays from 6. Then on 9 to noon, how to have a dog without owning one or paying the vet's bills. We meet the founder of the Dog Share Collective. And after 10, award-winning Kiwi novelist Tina Shaw on her timely young adult book about fighting off unwanted male attention. Join me, Lynn Freeman, standing in for Catherine Ryan after Morning Report on RNZ National. Met service weather through to tomorrow night. Northland, Auckland, Coromandel and coastal Waikato. A period of rain this evening with possible squally thunderstorms. Mainly fine tomorrow but rain returning from afternoon. Westerlies, gale in some places this evening. Inland Waikato to Wellington including Bay of Plenty and the central high country. Rain spreading north this afternoon turning to showers later. Fine tomorrow but rain and showers returning north of Kapiti from afternoon. For Gisborne to Wairarapa, rain spreading north today clear tomorrow morning. Nelson, Marlborough and Canterbury. Scattered rain clearing this evening. Mainly fine tomorrow but isolated afternoon and evening showers about Canterbury. Buller to Fiordland, Buller in Fiordland, in, in rain in Buller and Westland and mainly fine further south, becoming fine to, uh, everywhere tonight apart from a few showers until tomorrow. Southland and Otago, showers clearing from central Otago tonight and elsewhere later tomorrow. The Chatham Islands, occasional rain or showers, possibly heavy tomorrow. It's eight and a half past five and you're listening to Checkpoint. Gosh, there's some rubbish weather in that Katrina and we are keeping an eye on the winds that are heading towards Auckland, 35,000 homes. Or businesses still without power. That's coming up, but we're going to begin at the Commonwealth Games, where in a dramatic finish, New Zealand mountain bikers Sam Gaze and Anton Cooper have finished first and second. This happened about 10 to 5. The pair were repeating their 1 2 Glasgow performance on the Gold Coast, although in reversed order. Joe Porter, are you there? I am indeed. What boy, oh boy. I How just are you, want. John? Oh, well, good. I'm impressed by those men. They are fit. And I was watching Sam Gaze. And he didn't even seem to be puffing. Uh, it, remarkable. I tell you what, John, I'm sweating and I've done no physical activity. <laughs> the drama was that high. I can tell you now, Sam Gaze led for most of the race with Anton Cooper, of course, the pre-race favourites going into this. Anton Cooper, the defending gold medalist from the Glasgow 2014 Games. Sam Gaze, the silver medalist from the Glasgow 2014 Games. They led from start to finish on the very last lap. Sam Gaze suffers a mechanical, something to do with the seat post, it looked like. Drops back to third behind one of the South African riders. One lap to go. He then manages to sprint past the South African rider who in a nice sporting gesture let him past he cuts down Anton Cooper then with just metres remaining in the last lap they go arm to arm, handlebar to handlebar shoulder to shoulder 
uh, Sam Gaze squeezes past Cooper and then they race for a sprint finish to the line. Sam Gaze puts his finger to his mouth, kisses up to the sky and he's won his first Commonwealth Games gold medal, reversing of course the result from the 2014 Glasgow Games. We have to say they were overwhelmingly favourites going into this competition yeah. and I could see why it, it was with the exception of that of that uh, mechanical mishap as you said and great sportsmanship from the South African rider but boy they owned it didn't they Oh, they owned it from start to finish, from the start line to the end of the race. They were completely dominant, as expected. The Kiwi riders were just simply sensational on the uphill technical climbs. Many riders were coming off their bikes, getting off and walking. Not these two. They power through the rocks, up and down. Terrain that would be hard to walk. They are absolutely incredible, and what a dominant performance. And boy, oh boy, Sam Gaze. I mean, he is a true champion. He is the fastest man in the world right now. He beat the Olympic champion at a World Cup event just recently. He's now won Commonwealth Games gold, and there is just no one that can beat him. Anton Cooper, of course, coming incredibly close, but these two are just in a league of their own. Yes, sometimes in the Commonwealth you are not seeing the best in the world, but in this case you truly are. Let's talk about Lawn Bowls. What's happening there, Joe? Yeah, and we've picked up another medal, of course, so a gold and a silver in the men's mountain biking and a silver medal for the men's, uh, for the triples para and the lawn bowls, a great effort from them. They couldn't quite sneak past Australia this afternoon, but it was a tightly fought affair, so a wonderful result for them. And then Valerie Adams, of course, John, we didn't know what she was going to do when she came to this tournament. She hadn't been throwing much. She's, of course, had a baby just recently, her first child, but she came out and smashed it today. She's qualified for the final, only needing one throw. She only needed to throw 16 and a half metres. She threw 18 and a half, a metre further than her nearest rival. Britney's, uh, sorry, Canada's Brittany Crew. So again, Valerie, Dame Valerie Adams looking odds on for another gold in the track and field. Yes, she was just at her imperious best. I thought she was magnificent. And we need to point out, and this is a remarkable thing, if she wins, touch wood, oh. it will be her fourth consecutive Commonwealth Games gold. Is that right, Joe? That's right. And you've got to look at what training she's done, which is simply bugger all, really. She's come out... <laughs> After having a child not long ago, her first daughter spent a lot of time with her family and friends and this is probably going to be her last ever Commonwealth Games as she sort of sets off into the sunset with a record that's comparable to none. Uh, just a fantastic effort from her and boy oh boy, when she wants to produce, she can produce. She is just world class. Mm, she is. Joe Porter, thanks so much. I know you're off to talk to the mountain bikers, so we look forward to hearing from them later. Joe Porter, live at the Games, where Sam Gaze and Anton Cooper came in first and second in the mountain biking. They came in first and second in Glasgow too, but the other way round. Uh, so truly defending champs. No new offshore oil and gas, gas exploration, new being the key word, 57 permits uh, already exist and they will continue to exist. Now, whatever you think of that announcement and the responses we're getting a fairly polarised. The negotiations were a tricky juggling act for Jacinda Ardern. While she had campaigned on tackling climate change, and the Greens have that at the very centre of their policy platform and indeed identity, New Zealand First has attached its identity to regional development. And the regions, particularly Taranaki, where oil and gas are found, will be in Taranaki live in a moment. A public meeting taking place tonight. We have reaction from there. But first of all, here's our Deputy Political Editor, Chris Bramwell. Oil and gas exploration is the perfect storm for Labour as it seeks to balance the different positions of its support partners while keeping both the Greens and New Zealand First on side. The Greens want a fast track to the end of fossil fuel dependence while New Zealand First is keen to make sure the regions don't take an economic hit. But Jacinda Ardern says all parties in government are committed to taking action on climate change. She says there were discussions in the coalition talks about the extractive industries. As the Minister of Climate Change has made clear, it was already in their election manifesto. We were aware of that. From New Zealand First's position, it's already public that they want to see support for the extractive industries. And industries like silica are an area where we'll probably like to see more production rather than less. The Greens co-leader and climate change minister James Shaw struggled to contain a smile at today's press conference. But he says while the move is a good one, it doesn't go as far as he would have liked. We would like to be able to move faster on, on this transition, but we did always say that we would honour existing permits. The fact is that there's a phase out for onshore of another three years and we would like to move a little bit faster on that. We think that that would also provide more certainty to the industry. The Greens are claiming today's announcement as a big win for them, though it was always on the cards under Jacinda Ardern's leadership, particularly after she took the unusual step of personally accepting a Greenpeace petition to ban all oil and gas exploration at Parliament last month. 
The Economic Development Minister, New Zealand First, Shane Jones, says his party was well aware of the Prime Minister's views on fossil fuels when it signed up to the coalition. He says he's part of a genuine MMP government. But it's clear from Mr Jones's tone that this deal is a tough one for him to accept. I can't walk back from the status that I've had throughout my whole life as being a pro-industry man, but I am one person and I am loyal to the agreements that are struck by my leader and the Prime Minister. And it's futile to talk about alternative scenarios as of today this is the only scenario. There are 31 active oil and gas exploration permits, 22 of which are offshore. The government's at pains to point out that they run out as far as 2030 and could go an additional 40 years under a mining permit. But Nationals leader Simon Bridges describes the announcement as a wrecking ball for regional New Zealand. It's going to be a, a chill down the spine of New Zealand business because they saw it in irrigation, there was no consultation there, they've had it here, here no consultation, which you'd get if this was actually a transition, they just dropped with it and businesses will be asking who's next. Simon Bridges says the decision will actually have perverse outcomes for the environment. We've got a decade or under of gas left um, and that's what runs much of our heavy industry in the North Island but also through to the shops and the homes and when that gas runs out because it's going to now um, what you've got instead is imported coal with much higher emissions. Jacinda Ardern says the announcement is about sending a signal that there is change coming but in the meantime there are 57 approved exploration and mining permits in New Zealand and it's up to the industry whether they use them. The onshore block offers will continue in Taranaki for the next three years and will be reviewed after that. Atawiti Whare Pari Mata mō te hōtaka o te ahi pōnei, ko Chris Bramalahau. Shane Jones, the Regional Economic Development Minister, whose face was a picture during that media conference, will join us to discuss his take on it, what it means for the regions and why New Zealand First was in that media conference and there in support after six. But, of course, there has been a strong reaction in Taranaki to the government's announcement that it will not grant any new deep sea oil and gas exploration permits in the future. A public meeting is taking place there as we speak. We're going to go there live now. We're joined by our excellent Taranaki reporter, Robin Martin. Kia ora, Robin. What can you tell us? Kia ora, John. Um, uh, what I can tell you is the uh, Minister Andrew Little is uh, running a bit late. And uh, uh, behind me, you can pe perhaps see gathered, there's about um, 50, perhaps 100 uh, of the movers and shakers uh, from, from, from Taranaki, New Plymouth. Yeah, and as, and as you've said, there's been a, a really strong reaction here today. The mayor um, of New Plymouth, Neil Holdham, described the decision as a, as a kick in the guts. And um, the, uh, the chief executive of the uh, Chamber of Commerce, Arun Chandrai, um, said he was disappointed, that this, the decision was demoralising, um, and he's upset about, upset about the level of uh, consultation there's been. Um, and that's hence the meeting tonight. Um, but out on the street and around town, there were also um, other opinions. According to the most recent study, the oil and gas industry directly employs about 4,300 people in Taranaki and is linked to the creation of about 7,000 jobs in total. In 2015, it generated $1.5 billion of GDP in the region and workers in Taranaki enjoy some of the highest household incomes in the country. Speaking alongside a business investment conference in New Plymouth today, the chief executive of the Taranaki Chamber of Commerce, Arun Chandrai, says the government's announcement puts all that at risk. It's going to move uh, the hydrocarbon industry away uh, in the short term, there might still be a little bit of investment, but medium and long term, I think it's going to be very hard for the oil bosses or the hydrocarbon industry bosses to convince their bosses uh, to invest in this country. Mr Chaudhary says Taranaki business leaders have been blindsided by the decision. Uh, two weeks ago at the petroleum conference, the minister clearly announced, Minister Woods, that there would be a consultation process with all stakeholders uh, the Taranaki business community is a major stakeholder and we feel that we haven't had the opportunity to consult. A group of oil and gas workers at an inner city cafe initially laughed the announcement off as a joke before Brendan Carhill went into bat for the sector.
Some grannies think oil is man-made. Oil is a natural resource, a gift, you know, from Mother Earth for us to use. And sure, there's a better way of doing things, and in the meantime, uh, you know, there's been leaps and strides in, in, in you know, developing that new technology, but you're not going to run a Boeing 777 on LiPo batteries to LA. Yeah, it's a long time coming. <laughs> Mr Cahill says an end to offshore oil and gas exploration will have a huge effect on the Taranaki economy over time. At another coffee haunt of the sector, oil and gas services consultant Nick King took a more pragmatic view of the announcement. From a personal view, um, I don't think it will affect it going forward. I think it's probably uh, just a way that they've looked at it to... Uh, to fulfil their obligations with the Green Party. Winston Peters, not very, it's not much from him on it, but uh, understandable, you know, the, what they want to do, but I don't think it'll affect it. I think it's far too long, and how long will they be in power? Mr King says there are block offers still in place until 2030, and a lot could change between then and now. Bar and restaurant owner Mark Louis, who was in enjoying a coffee, however, took a more pessimistic view. I think it's quite bad because it'll put a... Um, People will lose confidence in the market, yeah. I know they're saying that long term, well for say 20 years there's going to be stuff still happening, but there won't be any new things coming in and people will lose confidence in the region. Do you think yeah. that will affect your business? Definitely, I think it will affect every business in town, everything. On the high street, sentiment came out in favour of the move. Yeah, I think it's an excellent idea. We're going to lose a lot of jobs, the jobs are important. The environmental side, it, it's really good. Um, but I'm also a bit concerned about the um, economy. We need to be realistic about global warming and start doing something about it. A bit sad for I mean, people working in oil and gas, but at the same time, it could be good for the environment. Yeah, I think that's, that's pretty awesome. didn't really like the whole idea of the place getting mined and oiled, so I think that's a great thing. Meanwhile, Climate Justice Taranaki says the move doesn't go far enough. It's disappointed more than 1,700 square kilometres of land in Taranaki may be released for new onshore drilling. Inamutu Motihotaka Oti Ahiahi, called Robin Martinaho. So that was Robin who was live at the meeting, the public meeting that Andrew Little is about to have with people in Taranaki who want to hear from the government about this. We will cross back to that meeting if anything of note happens. Uh, Robin Martin is there on standby, still waiting for the minister. Let's uh, go north from Taranaki to Auckland where tens of thousands of people are likely to be without power for a third night and there are more wild winds on the way. The latest numbers from Vector say 35,000 customers are currently without power. Now each customer is a home or a business rather than the individuals who live or work there so it's still a substantial number of people. In some communities that means no running water. In all communities it means no electric heating of course although it's warmer tonight in Auckland than it was on Tuesday. Tuesday and Wednesday. While most people appear philosophical about the storm, well, the cause of the cuts, there's growing frustration about the time it's taking to restore power and about a lack of communication from Vector about when power will be back. Jesse Chang reports. It's been a frustrating couple of days for Erin Hales, who lives in Piha. Unlike Aucklanders living in the city, she's not only having to tough it out with no power, there's no running water either. So this is our dark bathroom. Mm -hmm. The toilet, you keep the lid down. It's not pretty. There's no flush. Absolutely no flush. Nothing through the taps. Ms Hale says she and her husband have been taking showers at gyms and filling up bottles of water to keep them going. The Piha resident says in past power cuts, Vector brought in generators to keep things running. But that hasn't happened this time around, and Ms Hale says there's been no communication about why. She says while they've been told power may be restored by midday tomorrow, another rough night with the possibility of coastal tornadoes is forecast, and she's worried. Unlike main supply water houses, it, it comes to a point we can't wash hands, we can't wash ourselves our dishes, our children, um, and that is a health issue. The Met Service says there could be gusts of up to 120 kilometres an hour at around 10 o'clock. But even for those who do have running water, it's been a struggle. For Kasia Klee and her young family, they've been without power since thunderstorms began at 11 o'clock on Tuesday morning. She says the lights started flickering as the trees swayed into the power poles. I called Victor and asked them, you know, to report. I reported 
what was happening and they said oh they'd send some arborists or treescape people to come and cut down the trees and and then an hour later the power went off and it's been off since. Ms Clee says it's been difficult not having the means to keep her kids warm. She's grateful that her neighbours have offered extension cords and multi-plugs for them to keep their fridge and also a few necessities running. But Ms Clee says the response from Vector has been disappointing. She says when she's phoned the company, she's been put on hold for an hour, only to reach a standard response that they're only taking emergency calls, and then she was hung up on. Everything that I seem to go to, the website or their app, is out or hasn't been updated for many hours. Ms Clee says she's been told they'll have power back soon, but with no solid timeline, it's extremely hard for them to make plans. Victor's head of network program deliver, Minoru Fredrickson, says there are separate phone numbers for emergencies and non-urgent calls, so no one should be getting hung up on. But he says people phoning will need to be patient. But unfortunately, it's, it's a huge volume, you know, given given the number of outages and the and the size of the of the storm. Um, so we do, you know, we do apologise for that, but. You know, when you've got that many people, um, unfortunate queues will get quite long. 32,000 homes are still without power. Mr Federickson says crews may need to be stood down for safety if the wind gets too strong tonight, and that may slow progress in restoring power. For Checkpoint, call Jesse Chang TNA. Well, for the latest, we're joined now by the CEO of Vector, Simon McKenzie. Simon, thanks for joining us. Uh, what, are the, what are the latest numbers? How many homes and businesses still not connected? Yes, John. Um, the numbers are just on 25,000, just probably just slightly below 25,000 still to be restored. It's obviously down from the 180,000 when the storm struck. And the last time I looked online, it was saying 35,000. So you're getting reconnections going at a good clip still. Yeah, look, it's a it's a it's a reasonably good clip. Um, obviously, from our perspective, we totally understand the frustration with customers and all the crews are out there working 24-7 to get as many people back on as possible. When do you think you're going to have the bulk of people back on? Is it, I know the phrase that's been used was a few days, it was used on Checkpoint last night, it's just, uh, that, that's kind of a how long is a piece of string sort of phrase, isn't it? When, when do you think, reasonably, other than the people who are out on the coast there in areas that were hit very hard. When do you think the most people will be back? Look, I think that most people will be back by, um, certainly by close of play tomorrow. Um, we have published on the website our expectations of the areas and within those areas that we see the bulk of those customers in the areas being restored. But as you say, um, we don't want to... Um, mislead customers any way that there will be some areas that will take longer just because of the extent of the damage. Can we talk about the damage? My sense of it is obviously that a lot of trees fell and we know that because we've seen the pictures, they were everywhere. And the trees have taken lines down but there is now also a sense that there has been some more substantial and significant damage than that. For example, we're hearing reports of, uh, of at least one major transformer that blew up. Are there more substantial infrastructure issues than simply trees taking lines down? I'm certainly not aware of uh, more substantial. I mean, I've literally been out in the field myself this afternoon um, and the feedback from all the guys in the field is, is that, you know, basically just about all the damage has been caused by massive trees either coming down or pulling down power lines. We're talking about somewhere in the vicinity of 2,500 kilometres of lines that have been damaged. Um, and um, as can happen with these events, if there is a, a, um, a large tree comes over a line sometimes or tree branches going onto lines, they can cause the lines to clash and then there's a subsequent fault. But certainly all the damage that we see is absolutely predominantly branches and trees coming down over the lines. And of course, Georgina Griffiths from uh, the Mitzvahs is going to join us later in the program. But there are already uh, forecasts saying that there's going to be strong winds again, not across such a broad area of Auckland, but hitting parts of Auckland later tonight. That will be a real concern for you guys, right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, it's a concern also from our perspective, um, two key areas. Is one is that obviously we have to ensure the safety of the crews and and, you know, they just can't work in unsafe conditions. The other issue is the potential impact for customers to be 
um, impacted further customers to be impacted by you know storm damage. I mean, I think I've read reports of up to about 120 kilometre an hour winds. And uh, and obviously the other aspect is, is uh, as I mentioned, I've been out myself this afternoon, um, looking around that these storm events, there's still potentially limbs of trees or trees that may be weakened that another big blow can push them over and cause more subsequent damage. So well, yeah, sure, yeah, know, absolutely. Deal with it. And, and, you, and, and, the, and the safety of cruisers is paramount, of course. Will you be calling crews in as those winds get stronger later this evening? Well, we won't be, oh, would you say, calling them in. They, yeah. they have a standing instruction that they know not to work with the conditions are unsafe. So they only respond when it's safe to go back out and work. And, you know, part of the process that they have to go through when they go back out to work is to go and assess damage and reprioritise. Um, clearly, from our perspective, when the major winds came through the other night at that significant strength, the guys couldn't really get out in the field to assess the extent of the damage till the early hours of the morning. So whilst recognised some people were out from probably around about nine o'clock, it wasn't till the early hours of the morning where it was safe for, for the for the crews to get out there. Um, in addition to that, we've brought in crews from right across the country and in North Island. And um, you know, I've certainly, from my perspective, they're doing a fantastic job, and and they're certainly. Um, putting all the hours that they can before also managing the fatigue issues that we have to manage from a safety yeah, perspective. They absolutely are doing a fantastic job, but it is night three now, I guess, and whilst we all know this is act of God stuff, will you look at compensation, particularly for businesses who have lost revenue for, well, by tomorrow night, it's going to be the best part of a week? Well, look, this, we're not in a position to um, uh, focus on compensation. For, you know, this is a significant storm event, and um, you know this is uh, an event that's been caused, obviously, from the major hurricane force winds. And for those businesses, we obviously understand the the issues, but um, most businesses would have business interruption insurance. That's Simon McKenzie, CEO of Vector, joining us uh, live. So. Uh, the number falling fairly radically, but it's still substantial. Twenty, somewhere just over 20,000 uh, homes still without power in Auckland. And importantly, uh, some more wild winds are forecast for tonight. Uh, Georgina Griffiths from Met Service will join us later in the programme. <laughs> Yes, coming up on Checkpoint, we are going to try and look at where those winds will go. This is not as big a storm as we had the other night, but there will be strong winds just over a smaller area. We'll try and chart it. Uh, we're on the picket lines with nurses outside Waitakere Hospital as they try to garner support for better pay and working conditions. And Facebook founder Mark Zuckerberg gets a less easy ride during his second appearance on Capitol Hill. All that and uh, the Algerian plane crash and the latest from Syria coming up. We'd love your feedback. You can text us on 2101. You can tweet us at Checkpoint RNZ. We're on Facebook, of course, and our email address is checkpoint at radioNZ.co.nz. Here with the time at exactly 27 minutes to 6 is the 27 minutes to 6 headlines. A 13-floor commercial office building in central Wellington has been abruptly evacuated after engineers deemed the building unsafe to occupy. At about 2 o'clock, all occupants of 79 Bullcott Street were given two hours to get out. One of the tenants, Chris Roberts of the Tourism Industry Association, says they were told months ago that remedial action was planned. Senior Cabinet Minister Andrew Little will front a public meeting in Taranaki after the government announced it will end offshore oil and gas exploration. The Prime Minister announced today that no new offshore permits will be granted, although land-based block offers will continue in Taranaki for three years. The Mayor of New Plymouth has described it as a kick in the guts for the region. The number of properties without power in Auckland has now dropped to just over 25,000. Vector says more stormy weather tonight could hamper efforts to fix more than 600 faults, outages and reports of damage. Met Service says there's a risk of more tornadoes and 120 kilometre an hour winds at around 10 o'clock tonight, particularly in the west. At the Gold Coast Commonwealth Games, the New Zealand mountain bikers Sam Gaze and Anton Cooper have just won gold and silver respectively in the final. The race went down to the wire with Gaze producing an incredible last lap performance after suffering a mechanical 
problem early into the final lap. He was neck and neck with Cooper before squeezing past and claiming his first Commonwealth Games gold. The price of fuel has increased by three cents a litre to almost two dollars twelve cents for 91 petrol at BP NZ Energy Service stations. The cost of crude oil has climbed to 73 US dollars per barrel, the highest since the late uh, late 2014. Nurses are to be balloted about strike action. That's despite their agreeing today to an independent panel as a way of resolving their pay row. The nurses' organisation says that's needed in case the panel doesn't come up with a suitable result. Those are the headlines. I'll clear my throat and go away and plan be back at six o'clock. Excellent, Katrina Bannon. We're going to talk some nurse, uh, to some nurses before six about exactly what Katrina was just telling us in those headlines. Let's go to business news now with Emil Donovan and beaming in from Wellington. Hi, Emil. Uh, looking very smart indeed, Emil. A rebound in consumer spending from February to March. Actually quite a big one, right? Yeah, that's right. So we're over the election hump, John, and we're making it rain dollar bills, or at least digital dollar bills. Uh, this is from Stats New Zealand. Consumer spending um, through electronic cards, so that's FPOS cards, and credit cards and the like, it's up 1% from February into March. That might not seem a lot, but it's actually double what the market was expecting. Yep. Um, so that was actually largely off the back of a 3% rise in what's rather confusingly termed consumables, but really that means groceries, uh, drinks and alcohol, so good to know that we've got our priorities in order. Um, there was also a pretty big boost for the hospitality sector, that's of course bars, cafes and hotels and the like, uh, so clearly people were sort of trying their darndest to wring all the life out of what was a pretty long and magnificent summer by and large. Um, now of course that begs the question as to why, and according to the banks really it comes down to confidence. Uh, people have realised that a change in government does not mean uh, the beginning of an economic apocalypse and they're starting to loosen their purse strings, really. Um, Emil, we're just getting news that the Commonwealth Games uh, gold and silver medalists are going to uh, join us, so forgive me for shuffling my papers around wildly while you were talking, but tell us what the markets did today. Uh, the NZX50 was down very slightly, 49 points, that's 0.58 of a percent. It closed on 8404, and the dollar, John, was about as steady as it gets. It closed uh, buying 73.6 US cents, 95 Australian, and 51.9 pence. Thank you so much, Emil Donovan. It's all on for young and old tonight. We're about to be joined live by Sam Gaze and Anton Kupu, who've just won gold and silver in the mountain biking. But we've been talking a lot about weather tonight. Let's get the latest from the Met Service. Uh, John Law beams in as well from Wellington. Kia ora, John. Kia ora. Another area of windy weather moving up and across to the far northern parts of the country as we go through the night time tonight, Thursday into Friday, but should clear away. And for Friday, it's... I'm just going to interrupt you. I'm so sorry. That's extremely rude. But let's go to uh, Joe Porter, who is with uh, Sam Gaze and Anton Cooper live. Yeah, it worked out well. So the race was panning out how you planned until that last lap. Talk me through what went through your mind when you got the mechanical. Um, yeah, so once I had the mechanical, you know, there's nothing I could do to take it back. I was in the situation, there's nothing else I could do. And so I had to think about the best, take the best out of the situation. So I knew I had to lead into that downhill to minimise any gap. And then I knew I had to, you know, get things done as quick as possible. Uh, my mechanic, Ollie, was exceptional today. You know, he uh, really raised the, raised the task and I was happy I had him otherwise this, this Thing wouldn't be hanging around my neck right now. Um, but yeah, as soon as I got it out of the way, I sort of realised that, you know, I've got nothing to lose and if I can get back then it'd be great. But if not, I'm not going to live with myself for sitting up. So uh, yeah, I pushed back and I knew as soon as uh, we got to that second third zone that I had the race in the back. So you cut down the South African, you're closing in on Anton. Where did you see your spot to pass and how did you go about that? I knew it was the first nerve descent that won the race and uh, yeah, it was made a little bit tougher by uh, Almost, and he crashed at the top of the climb, and um, yeah, you know, you can't really blame the guy. Uh, you know, um, it's the way it is in sport. And so I'm happy to, you know, get past there, and then I led into the uh, the sprint, and from there on out, I just had to do what I was, yeah, came here to do. Shoulder to shoulder, handlebar to handlebar, it must be an exciting way to finish a race. Wouldn't have any other way, mate. And coming into that sprint in the battle, John, you knew you had it in the bag by then, of course. Yeah, I feel like uh, there's not many people. Uh, that's one of my strong points, you know, uh, and so. 
I knew as soon as I hit the time mark that it was a day done, job done. You know, I got to start focusing now on the road race. <laughs> An incredible effort from Anton as well. Kiwi won too, which is a fantastic result to reverse, of yeah. course, the result of the Commonwealth Games last time round. Um, just a fantastic performance from the Kiwis who really excelled on those technical climbs. Yeah, you know, Anton's an incredible athlete. Uh, and that uh, goes without saying, you know, he's won uh, numerous world titles. He's uh, shown that he's pure quality, defending champion here. And so um, it's always nice to be the top Kiwi, but uh, these days to be the top Kiwi, you probably have to be the best in the world. You beat the Olympic champion recently to win the World Cup. Now you've got a Commonwealth Games gold medalist. You're the fastest man on the planet. <laughs> Hope to keep it like that. And what do you, what's it like having a gold medal draped around your neck compared to a silver? <laughs> Yeah, it's good. You know, I came here for gold. I'm living with gold, and now uh, I have the incredible opportunity now to, uh, you know, help the road guys uh, achieve what they want to. And uh, I'm feeling good, feeling power strong, and so yeah, you never know. We'll see what happens on Saturday. You said anything less than gold here, you would consider a failure. The fire was definitely in the belly. Yeah, exactly. And now uh, I think I can call it a success. Excellent. Thank you. Cheers, very much. mate. Appreciate Cheers, bro. it. Thank well you. done. It's Joe Porter talking to Sam Gaze. We need to remind you that Sam Gaze and Anton Cooper came first and second uh, in Scotland in 2014, of course, but it was the other way around. Anton Cooper won this uh, games, these games at Gold Coast. Anton came second, got silver. Sam Gaze, who really is now considered the best mountain biker in the world, got the gold. His training regime, they say, is absolutely formidable, gruelling course. And he didn't even look that tired at the end of it. So the Kiwis have just won gold and silver in the mountain biking about uh, oh, an hour ago. An early childhood centre which sent dirty nappies and food scraps home with an infant and a teacher who assaulted their own child but was still working among what appears to be a record number of complaints about early childhood education centres in 2016. The Education Ministry has just published its annual early childhood complaint summary, which shows it investigated and found evidence of problems, including abuse of children, poor health and safety, and inappropriate staff behaviour. In total, it upheld 163 complaints. That's upheld 60 more than the preceding year. Our education correspondent, John Gerritsen, has been reading the Ministry's report and joins us now live from our Wellington studio. Hi, John. This, uh, this ain't great, is it? No, it's not. And I mean, interestingly, there's, there's the overall number of complaints, that 331 complaints, is about the same, a little bit less than last year, a little bit less than 2014. Um, so the overall complaints are staying pretty stable. But what's changed is the number of complaints upheld. It's really jumped um, from about 104 complaints uh, in 2015 to 163 complaints upheld in 2016. And it's also, the Ministry's also really cracked down on early childhood services. It shut down 23 three centres in 2016, uh, put 24 on provisional licences or suspended their licences. Now I couldn't actually find a figure for 2015 but in 2014 it took that sort of action with only 10 services. So, so it's like a fourfold jump there. So it seems the Ministry is getting better at investigating problems uh, when, uh, when the complaints come to it and it's taking sterner action. Right, what sort of problems was the Ministry finding and particularly what sort of complaints were they upholding? But what, what have you seen going through those papers? Yeah, there's not a lot of detail here about the individual complaints and which ones uh, sparked the sternest action. But the biggest area of complaints were health and safety, uh, management and administration, and also the standard of education, the way the curriculum was being delivered. But there were some really disturbing ones in there. There's uh, 12 cases upheld by the ministry involving teachers behaving inappropriately, uh, 12 involving physical or emotional harm of children. So that could be ver ver uh, verbal abuse, uh, but it could also be physical harm to children, and there were 18 cases upheld relating to unsafe premises. Right, what's the Ministry saying about all of this, John? I haven't had a chance to speak with them yet, but in, in releasing this information, they've really stressed that uh, it, it involves only a small percentage, a small number of like 4,600 early childhood services. So they say overall, you know, the sector is, is good, has high quality. But I know some teachers really are concerned that there's some centres out there that are substandard, that maybe don't have enough teachers, that are squeezing a lot of children into a small space. Um, they haven't had a lot of confidence about complaining to the ministry, about complaining to the uh, Education Review Office when they see problems because they're not confident that anything will happen. So these figures showing more cases being upheld uh, and more um, stern action being taken will probably uh, give heart to a lot of those teachers and perhaps encourage them to complain. John Gerritsen, our education correspondent. Thanks so much, John. We really appreciate it. These uh, figures, this information with the ministry just out this afternoon. 
Nurses picketed outside Waitakere Hospital for two hours this morning trying to garner support for their pay and working conditions dispute with the country's district health boards. This is going to be big and tough. We sent Zach Fleming along to talk to nurses, but uh, by the time he got there, they were packing up and going home. However, after a bit of wrangling, Zach managed to speak to three nurses who weren't even involved in the picket today. The women dashed outside in their scrubs to share their stories. We start with Geraldine, who's been a nurse for 25 years and who told Zach she just wants enough staff to look after the patients coming through the hospital's doors. Every ward's different. My unit is outpatient, so currently I can have between 11 and 13 nurses on a shift. That sounds like a lot. But when we're caring for nearly 300 patients a day plus our inpatient unit, that is not enough. So we're currently working with our manager to address our staffing issues. How many nurses would you ideally like to have? If we're talking purely what's best for patients here? Ideally at least 15, 15 to 16 nurses. So every day you're currently maybe three to four nurses short of what you need? Yeah, absolutely. Some areas are worse than us. Um, the more acute areas like where Diane works beside me, that, that's ED. So they, they need staff definitely on the front door, absolutely. And then, so the other major thing is salary. How yeah. much do you currently earn? Uh, not willing to say a share, okay, though. Okay. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. That's okay, but <laughs> what kinds of things are you struggling with because of your salary? Uh, cost of living, so trying to pay for fuel, pay my mortgage, pay for my daughter's schooling. I, both myself and my husband are nurses, so we've got two nurse salaries coming in, and we struggle. Every month is a struggle, so that's what we're doing. But I'm also hearing from nurses living in the cars, and I don't think that's right. How often do you treat yourself, you and your husband, go out for a, for a movie or a nice romantic dinner? We don't. <laughs> we don't. We truly don't. Because and is that just a money thing? Yeah, absolutely. Money and shift work, but yeah, money, definitely we don't. We've got too many other things going on, too many other commitments to actually go out and treat ourselves. If you can think back to 1993 when you decided to become a nurse, yeah. would you have ever expected 25 years later to be in a position where you and your husband don't have enough money to, to go and do those nice things for yourself, even like once a fortnight, once a month? No, definitely not. When I first came to New Zealand, I'll give you an example, I could fill my shopping trolley for maybe $100, $140. Now to feed my family, I'm looking at $200, $260. That's just to buy essentials. So really, no, it's completely changed. The cost of living, especially in Auckland, is horrific. And your salary wage hasn't matched that, has it? No, definitely not. Hasn't kept up with that, no. And for Diane, the emergency department nurse who Geraldine mentioned, she says the ED ideally needs one nurse for every four patients, but most days it has... Seven to one. So you have one and seven and you need yes. one and four? Yes. That's shocking, isn't it? I mean, it's nearly half of, of what you need That's to look right. after your patients. That's correct. And what does that result in? Are you guys basically running makes, around the wards? Yes, we are trying to help each other. We are trying to make patients safe we are trying to keep ourselves face uh, safe and that puts stress on us and we go home are we able to sleep well no because we think back on the day and you think have i done everything for this patient that needed to be done we come back the next day to check is this patient still around is that the life that we should be leading when we are giving our our time and our values that we have personal values to care for other people. You're basically running to stand still, aren't you? Yes. How long have you been a nurse for, Dane? Over 20 years. Do you love it? I love my job. I love my job. Do you think that you should be able to, you know, like Geraldine would like to go out and do some nice things occasionally by being, oh, while yes. being a nurse? yes, I'd love to do that maybe once in three months, but that's an impossibility because I can't afford to do that. And with the stress levels that we have with our job situation, we need it. Do you think you could do this for much longer? So you, if I can kind of summarise, so you come to work and you have a very stressful job, you come home from work and you're still stressed out, you're struggling to sleep, you come back to work and you're stressed out from possibly making mistakes the day before or someone else might have made mistakes the day before and then the weekend comes or your day off comes and you're probably still stressed about work and you can't do those nice things that you want to do. Can you keep this up much longer? I don't think many nurses are going to be able to keep this much longer. We are having to face whereby our new grads are spending a year here in New Zealand. We are training them. We are spending all this money to train them within the hospitals. And within a year, they are going over the ditch. Why? We should be asking that question. The powers that be need to be asking Why that do you question. Think? What do you think? It is the money. 
and it's the safe staffing issues. They feel unsafe. They don't have the confidence. What would you expect then? Definitely, if they are so stressed, I, they are going to run away. Are you considering doing the same thing, going overseas to Australia? Possibilities are galore. So if things do not change here, there is going to be a huge exodus of nurses. Standing next to Geraldine and Diane is Ramya, an overseas registered nurse who has worked in Saudi Arabia and India. I asked her to compare there to here. It's it's mostly differs with the staffing. It's a bit a, a lot different when we compare back home and here and even in Saudi Arabia. A lot different, she says, because in cardiology where she works, one nurse for every four patients is ideal. But most days, she says it has one nurse per... Uh, like five, six, seven, it depends, you know, and each shift it varies. And uh, we cannot expect what's going to happen in the shift. And sometimes it will be like very busy with uh, some kind of emergencies and patient might have a fall. Um, sometimes they might have uh, deteriorated. So we need more staff there and that affects the other patients. Three nurses, three different departments, same story. We need more staff. For Checkpoint, Zach Fleming. Nine and a half to six people asking what happened to the weather. Well, the Commonwealth Games uh, gold medalist came in, but we're going to talk to Georgina Griffiths from the Met Service after six, and we're going to focus on what's going to happen in Auckland later tonight. Strong winds uh, in fairly localised areas expected to come in from about eight o'clock. Georgina will tell us all about it after six. The White House says no final decision has been taken on military strikes against Syria, despite a volley of reasonably incendiary tweets from the US president. The US blames the Syrian government and its main ally, Russia, for the weekend's chemical attack in Douma, deadly chemical attack. Of course, the US response has been promised, and Syria appears to be preparing for airstrikes, but US officials say all options are still on the table. The UN Security Council is due to discuss Syria in private tomorrow. Interesting, of course, because Russia is a permanent member. Looking at all of this, the BBC's John Sopel. From surviving the hell of eastern Ghouta and the alleged chemical weapons attack, refugees have buses to take them away, but to a still uncertain future. We lived through very difficult times in the eastern Ghouta, especially the final three days in Douma, when the regime carried out its attacks on civilian neighborhoods and used chlorine gas, which caused suffocation among civilians. And it's not just refugees. According to many accounts, Syrian soldiers are on the move as well, temporarily abandoning barracks ahead of any US-led attack. The threat of military action brought this warning from one of Russia's most senior diplomats in the region. If there is a strike by the Americans, then we point to the declarations made by the President Vladimir Putin and the Russian military leadership that the missiles will be downed and even the sources from which the missiles were fired. But those comments had the effect of goading the President and this incendiary tweet. Russia vows to shoot down any and all missiles fired at Syria Get ready, Russia, because they'll be coming nice and new and smart. And at the Defence Department, they're preparing for all eventualities. We're still assessing the, uh, the intelligence uh, ourselves and our allies. We're still working on this. We stand ready to provide military options if they're appropriate, uh, as the president determines. Although a slightly more conciliatory tone later from the president when he said Russia needs us to help with their economy, something that would be very easy to do. And we need all nations to work together. A year ago, the US military launched a one-off cruise missile attack on a Syrian airfield. It seems as though the US is preparing for something more extensive and more sustained this time, and with other nations involved. The eyes to the right, 272. The nose to the left, 285. Yeah! Five years ago, when Barack Obama was president, plans for military action by the US fell apart after the British Parliament voted against such a move. But it looks as though this time round, Theresa May is giving her American counterpart the nod there'll be no such impediments. All the indications are that the Syrian regime was responsible and we will be working with our closest allies on how we can ensure that those who are responsible are held to account and how we can prevent and deter the humanitarian catastrophe that comes from the use of chemical weapons in the future.
The strident language we're hearing from both sides is, frankly, more akin to two heavyweight boxers trash-talking at the weigh-in before their bout. But leaving the words to one side, there are the wider strategic questions of what is American policy now towards Syria? Does it support regime change? Does it want further involvement or to pull out? On those questions, we're none the wiser. John Sopel reporting. Let's head uh, west from Syria to the North African country of Algeria, which has been plunged into mourning as rescue workers sift through the mangled and charred fuselage of a military transport plane which crashed, killing more than 250 people. The plane crashed into a field shortly after takeoff from an airfield near the capital, Algiers. The BBC's Caroline Hawley reports. The military plane had only just taken off when witnesses said they saw either a wing or an engine on fire. It then plunged into a field close to the base. Television pictures from the scene showed rescuers and paramedics around the charred and smoking wreckage and long rows of body bags. The plane was on its way to Tindouf near the border with Morocco and the disputed territory of Western Sahara, where separatists from a group called the Polisario Front are seeking independence. The Polisario Front says that among the dead are 30 of its members, including women and children returning from medical treatment in the capital, Algiers. Ten crew members were also killed but most of those on board the Soviet-era transport plane were military personnel and family members travelling with them. <laughs> this man lost his best friend, Ramsey. <laughs> it's tearing me up, he told the private and Nahar channel. Tearing me up. We speak to each other every day. It's not yet clear what's caused Algeria's worst ever air disaster, the deadliest crash in the world since the Malaysian Airlines flight MH17 was shot down over eastern Ukraine in 2014. The government has ordered an urgent investigation and three days of national mourning. That's the BBC's Caroline Hawley. Let's go back to the US. Facebook founder Mark Zuckerberg didn't have such an easy ride during his second appearance on Capitol Hill. After yesterday appearing before a Senate committee, he faced a more aggressive grilling from members of a House of Representatives committee about whether his company can be trusted to protect the privacy of its users. It all comes, of course, in the wake of this Cambridge Analytica scandal and Russian meddling in the US elections. Again, we're with the BBC. This time the reporter is Amal Rajan. Round two. Mark Zuckerberg's second testimony in as many days promised to make amends for the first. Yesterday, meandering questions and blatant ignorance about how Facebook actually works led to a poor show by Congress. Today had to be better, and there were flashpoints. Let me ask you, is it true that Facebook offered to provide what I guess you refer to as dedicated campaign embeds to both of the presidential campaigns? Congressman. I can quickly respond to the first point, too. Just say there's yes a, or no. A, were, were there the, embeds? I need to get to that because I don't have time. Were there embeds in the two campaigns or offers of embeds? Congressman, yes we, or no? We, we, Time and again, so the rigid structure inhibited the lawmakers. With just four minutes each, they often overlapped and failed to pin him down. Where does privacy rank as a corporate value for Facebook? Congresswoman, giving people control of their information and how they want to set their privacy is foundational to the whole service. It's not just a kind of an add-on feature, something we have okay. to comply with. Well, the reality I, is, when if you have a photo, if you just think about this in your your day-to-day -day no, life. No, I, I can't let you filibuster right now. A constituent. The attacks grew more pointed and personal. The 33-year-old billionaire was accused repeatedly of being, in effect, a spy. You're collecting medical data, correct, on on people that that are on the internet, whether they're Facebook users or not, right? Congresswoman, yes, we collect some data for And you're collecting, and uh, you watch where we go. Facebook also gathers that data about where we travel. Isn't that correct? Congresswoman, everyone has control over how that works. I'm going to get to that, but yes, you are. Would you just acknowledge that, yes, Facebook is, that's the business you're in, gathering data and aggregating that data. Congresswoman, right? I disagree with that characterization. You are not, are you saying then came a revelation. Was your data included in the data sold to the malicious third parties? Your personal data? Yes. It was. For now, the significance of any mistakes Zuckerberg made remains unclear. Through nearly 10 hours of grilling, he kept his composure. I suppose you don't want to hang around for another round of questions. <laughs> Just kidding. Zuckerberg's interrogation generated over $17 billion for shareholders. That's around $1.5 billion an hour. Not bad, even for Silicon Valley.
The past 48 hours were a missed opportunity for American lawmakers that showed why global governance of these tech giants is so hard. Regulators are inevitably parochial, whereas the companies are international. And frankly, there is often a generation gap between politicians and the precocious entrepreneurs of Silicon Valley. Gridlock in Congress means that its new data law is coming next month from Brussels rather than Washington. That should worry Zuckerberg most, but he'll sleep easier tonight. Amar Rajan from the BBC with that fascinating report. We're about 45 seconds away from the news at six. Katrina is here and she is holding the scripts. After six, we're going to talk to Shane Jones, who is, of course, the Regional Economic Development Minister. Now, if the uh, end of uh, offshore oil and gas exploration is a victory for the Greens, what is it for New Zealand first? Because regional development is a thing that they have tied themselves very closely to. Of course, 57 permits exist and they will stand. And we're going to look at what the wind is going to do in Auckland, more than 20,000 customers still without power and strong winds forecast for later this evening. Heading Auckland sometime after 8, Georgina Griffiths from the Met Service will join us after the news. RNZ News at 6. Nga mihi. Good evening. Ko Katrina Batanaho. Vector says there could be delays in getting power restored to tens of thousands of Aucklanders because another storm is coming. Just over 25,000 customers are still without power. And damaging winds and possible tornadoes are forecast tonight, particularly for the city's west. Vector crews are still working to fix more than 600 faults and outages. The company says that as well as slowing progress, tonight's storm might well also cause more outages and crews will have to be stood down for their safety. Piha residents who don't have power or running water say they feel like they're being shoved aside by Vector. Erin Hale says she and her husband have been taking showers at gyms and filling up bottles of water to keep going with. She says she would have thought those living in rural areas would, have more of, would be more of a priority. Unlike main supply, water houses, it, it comes to a point we can't wash hands, we can't wash ourselves, our dishes, our children um, and that is a health issue. Erin Hale. Civil Defence says it's hearing anecdotal reports of a small number of houses without working toilets and it's asking those affected to get in touch so help can be got to them. New Zealand Sam Gaze and Anton Cooper have made it 2-1-2 in the men's mountain biking at the Commonwealth Games with Gaze winning gold and Cooper silver. The race went down to the wire with Gaze producing an incredible last lap performance after getting a puncture and dropping back to third. His team's quick thinking allowed him to make up lost time. We didn't change the wheel. Uh, my mechanic, Ollie, uh, just bombed it with a SCI2 canister. So I maybe lost about 15 seconds. And then from there I was able just to get really good into my work. I felt like I conserved a lot in this race, and so luckily I was able to you know, pull that on the last lap to get myself back into the winning position. Sam Gaze, another New Zealander, Ben Oliver, just missed out on a medal by coming fourth. The Tourism Industry Association is one of many organisations and businesses suddenly evacuated this afternoon from a 13-storey building in central Wellington. The evacuation was ordered after engineers found cracks in the floor at 79 Bullcott Street. The cracks have been there since the building went up in the late 1970s, but during an inspection today, the engineers identified them as being concerning. The association's chief executive, Chris Roberts, says tenants were told some months ago that a structural issue had been identified and remedial action was planned. We received a letter as recently as yesterday saying that there were no serious concerns and that the building was safe to occupy. So something has obviously happened between receiving that letter yesterday and today. Chris Roberts is assuring tourism operators that the industry's trends conference will still go ahead as planned in Dunedin next month. Nurses are to be balloted on industrial action while a panel seeks to resolve their pay row with the DHBs. The members of the three-person panel are expected to be named early next week and the nurses spokesperson C. Payne says their work is expected to take three to four weeks. In the meantime, nurses will be balloted online about whether they want industrial action and, if so, when. In the event that this panel doesn't provide us with a, a suitable outcome and that our members reject it, then we will need to be ready to continue to advance nurses and our members' interests. C. Payne. District health boards say they want to make it clear to nurses that they don't need to strike to be heard. 
And a New Zealand flight has been hit by a green laser strike at Kerikeri Airport in Northland. The plane had just taken off just after 6 this morning when it happened. The police want to hear from anyone who saw it or knows anything about it. One of America's most powerful Republican Party politicians unexpectedly announced his retirement today but insists he has no plans to run for any other office. Paul Ryan, who's been Speaker of the US House of Representatives since 2015, has sometimes been tipped for higher office, with some speculation he might even have a tilt at the presidency. But the 48-year-old says he wants to spend more time with his family. I did not seek this job. I took it reluctantly. Uh, but I have given this job everything that I have. And I have no regrets whatsoever for having accepted this responsibility. What I realize is, if I am here for one more term, my kids will only have ever known me as a weekend dad. I just can't let that happen. Paul Ryan's departure is considered a huge blow for his party. It's four and a half past six. To sport, and as you may have just heard, New Zealand mountain bikers Sam Gaze and Anton Cooper have won gold and silver at the Commonwealth Games, but the Para Lawn Bowls triples team have had to settle for silver after a thriller against Australia. They were one ahead going into the final end, but Australia's last bowl of the match clinched a 14-13 win. Dame Valerie Adams has put her shot put rivals on notice by qualifying, by qualifying easily for tomorrow night's final. Her throw of 18.52 metres was more than a metre longer than that of her nearest challenger. The Chiefs believe they have already proven themselves in the Super Rugby competition as worthy competitors for the Hurricanes tomorrow night, despite a growing injured players list. Assistant coach Neil Barnes says there may be uncertainty over whether Damian McKenzie will play, but the side will have more than a capable bench, as proved in their win over the Blues last week. We've shown in the last three or four weeks that we can take the game 80 minutes and keep people under pressure and we'll get the result we want at the end if we stay calm and composed about what we're doing. Um, we'd certainly like things to function better in the time before that, but it is what it is. The Blues, I think, are a team that are better than what the results show, so they put us under a lot of pressure and we had to work hard to get the result we wanted. Neil Barnes of the Chiefs. That's the news. Tonight on Nights, William Dart searches for happiness during New Horizons. The birds are coming home to roost in our changing world. They have the geolocators to prove it. And our overseas correspondent, Motoko Kakubayashi, is on the line from Japan, where there is pollen in the air. You can tell because half the people on the train are wearing face masks. And I drop in tonight's at 10. We'll be talking to people who have made the news or are just worth talking to. We'll have an eye on books, music and politics, keeping you up to date with the world at the other end of the day and bringing you breaking news as it happens. That's Lately with Karen Hay on Nights with Brian Crump on RNZ National. Met service weather through to midnight tomorrow. Northland, Auckland, Coromandel and Wai coastal Waikato, a period of rain this evening with possible squally thunderstorms. Mainly fine tomorrow, but rain returning from afternoon, westerlies, gale in some places this evening. Inland Waikato to Wellington, including Bay of Plenty in the central high country, rain spreading north this afternoon, turning to showers later. Fine tomorrow, but rain and showers returning north of Kapiti from afternoon. Gisborne to Wairarapa, rain spreading north today, clearing tomorrow morning. Nelson, Marlborough and Canterbury, scattered rain, clearing this evening, mainly fine tomorrow, but isolated afternoon and evening showers about Canter Canterbury. For Buller to Fiordland, rain in Buller and Westland are mainly fine further south, becoming fine every Everywhere tonight, apart from a few showers until tomorrow. Southland and Otago, showers clearing from central Otago tonight and elsewhere later tomorrow. The Chatham Islands, occasional rain or showers, possibly heavy tomorrow. It's coming up to eight minutes past six and you're listening to Checkpoint. Thank you very much, Katrina Vatten. We'll have more on the weather in a moment, but we return first to what the Mayor of New Plymouth has called a kick in the guts. Business New Zealand has called crude and unnecessary. And Greenpeace has called a huge win for climate and people power. If you've just turned in, we were looking at this earlier in the programme, the government's decision to end new oil and gas exploration in offshore waters. The word new is key. The 57 exploration permits already in existence standard. The government has repeatedly evoked the likelihood of further oil and gas fines in the areas those permits cover. But in a three-party coalition government, this is a big win for the Greens and a concession for New Zealand First. That's MMP, of course. But Regional Economic Development Minister Shane Jones told me earlier the 57 existing permits mean this is not the end of oil and gas exploration in the regions. 
So none of those permits are being summarily changed as a consequence of today's announcement. Um, the people that are currently going to work at the Methanex plant, they're just all going to keep going to work. But it is fair to point out that this is a clear demonstration on behalf of the, of the government by the Prime Minister that the direction of travel is such that we're not going to inherit from the last government international obligations that they sign up to and not actually do something about it at home. Yeah, 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 yeah. But this is a balancing act, isn't it? Because in Taranaki, they are saying this is what we do. In very simple terms, they are scared for their jobs. And I think that the Prime Minister, when she goes up to Taranaki, will be able to allay those anxieties. But I would say, John, I wouldn't over-catastrophise what we're doing today. It's not unreasonable for a sovereign government to say, right, we've got these international obligations, we've got our regional duties, and I certainly bear them very, uh, very mindfully, but at the end of the day, leadership, whether you're in metropolitan or provincial New Zealand, does require you to make bold and, and on occasions make troubled decisions. Yeah, sure. But, but troubled for whom? It's not over-catastrophizing, surely, to ask if there are 7,000 jobs in Taranaki directly or indirectly dependent upon oil or gas exploration or extraction. What is going to happen to those jobs in the future? Well, let's just go for a quick journey down New Zealand's history. I remember, because my dad was a farmer, how catastrophic the Rogernomic changes were. I don't think it's unreasonable for a government who wants to lay out a strategy going forward and lead a narrative that will have an impact on certain uh, segments of the economy. It should do that. Secondly, <clears throat> this is not under th th this is not undermining other types uh, other segments in the economy and as um the prime minister i said earlier today we have an ambitious program for infrastructure we're going to need the human capital associated with engineering and related skills to provide the services as we achieve our uh, in, uh, our infrastructure Absolutely, upgrade. absolutely but speak to those 7000 jobs fair to say speak, it's a net speak, zero speak, sum game no absolutely and also, uh, you know, the world changes. I mean, you, your point about the subsidies is well made, and there will be many of our listeners nodding. But let's speak to those 7,000 jobs in Taranaki, which are very particular jobs. What do you say to the people who say this is not over-catastrophizing? What do you say to Neil Holdham, who, who was saying it is a kick in the guts to the economy of our region? What is your response to that? Oh, look, I don't want to get into a slanging match with um, Neil. I met him recently, and, and look, he's got his job to do. He, 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 he obviously has to stand up and give voice to the anxieties of um, some of the community up in that neck of the woods. And I, I've got no problem with him doing it, in all honesty. But I would say this announcement today does not represent the loss of any jobs of anyone who is currently involved in the oil and gas sector. There is a huge potential field off the coast of Oamaru. I'm told that it could be inordinately large. It could change the entire earnings profile of this sector. Those rights are intact. The new owners are more than both capable and certainly legally entitled to continue to exploit and develop those rights. But this is a long-term signal that our government is going to work not only with the regions, but it's going to be honest. It has to be honest in the sense that we cannot uh, wander around internationally trying to burnish our credentials and then sneak back home and say, oh, it's fine to sign up to these international duties and do jack about it. That's not the government that I'm a part of. Boy, oh boy, people are suggesting that you are swallowing a dead rat here. And I was looking at you at the media conference and you were a one-man meme factory. Your hand was over your face, your <laughs> arms were... Well, you know, and people are looking. People are reading the tea leaves. Every time you go outside, Shane Jones, people want to see what's in your cup. Are you playing with a straight bat here because you are operating under instruction or do you really mean this stuff? 
Well, <clears throat> for the small number of Kiwis who, who know me, they know that I'm a fairly expressive sort of uh, character. Yeah, but Perhaps, what were you expressing? Uh, That's the point. What, to what? a fault. Well, no, no, I mean, uh, I think I was wiping my brow. It was nothing more than that. But look, I, I'm, I, I'm not oblivious. I'm, I'm not ignorant to the fact that in taking um, the provinces on a journey of moving from volume to value, which is the dairy reality, from moving from the voluminous exports of logs to manufacturing to bioenergy, that, that, that is a big task for any nation as it seeks to change the nature of its political economy. So the point I would have your listeners take on board, this is one sector. Yes, it is a sector that creates a lot of emotional energy. Yes, there were some graphic images with Greenpeace trying to stop... Um, drilling but as a consequence of the of the rights remaining intact seismic testing for example is not going to be outlawed it's just going to happen within the context of the many rights that have already been allocated and to suggest otherwise i think is trying to not so much gild the lily but it's trying to oil a machine that uh, seeks to spread um, damage and divisiveness Shane Jones talking to us from Parliament earlier this afternoon. A lot of feedback coming in on this. Thank you. We've also just got news from the Gold Coast. Sam and Ben O'Day have won a bronze in the Commonwealth Beach Volleyball. A bronze for the brothers Sam and Ben O'Day. Justin. Some Aucklanders still recovering from Tuesday night's storm could be in for a second hit tonight with severe gales and thunderstorms forecast for tonight. With a possibility of coastal tornadoes, almost 200,000 customers lost power earlier in the week. And Vector is warning some customers who have had their power restored may possibly lose it again, particularly coastal areas of West Auckland. Met Service meteorologist Georgina Griffiths tells us what Aucklanders can expect. Yeah, well, the key thing for Auckland and Northland, who have been quite impacted, particularly in Auckland, is to know it's a very different type of wind event. So that's really, really important. I'll say that again. This is not the big wind numbers that we were putting in on Tuesday night. And we di we aren't using the widespread wind tool, the broad scale warning in place. We're actually thinking the wind gust tonight will be brief, but localised, so you may not get one. And the biggest risk is out west, of course, so same places that had were hardest hit on Tuesday night. Places like Mirawai, Piha, Manukau heads in Afitu. But the further west you go, the higher the chance of seeing a localised damaging wind gust 10 o'clock tonight, 11 o'clock tonight. Damaging. And then it's all gone. So yeah, what are we damaging. talking about? But not everyone will see it. See yeah. it. So that's the difference. We've got little tools, thunderstorm tools, are little pieces of um, severe weather. And we've got the big tool, the widespread warning. So on Tuesday night, we had top end wind numbers, 130 plus. Um, all of Auckland affected, everybody was going to see it. This one is quite different and we're talking because of course Auckland is still really vulnerable after the last mm. decent big blow. So this is a little, we're using the little tool, the thunderstorm watch for damaging straight line wind or a coastal tornado coming onto the beach from the Tasman side tonight. So if if you're unlucky, you'll see damaging winds similar to the other night, but you, most people won't be unlucky. Right, so from the Tasman side, so that is the west coast, what sort of strength are we talking about? So gusts, 110 to 120 kilometres an hour, straight line winds or damaging tornado on the beach line. Um, tonight, just for a, a, an hour and a half, something like that when it comes on, just along the front. So those numbers are lower than what we had in, on Tuesday night, and we're not saying this time that everyone will see it. But I still think we're in for a wet and windy night out there. Um, it's not ideal, of course, if your property's still impacted, mm. if your power lines are still down and you've got half a tree hanging out the back. So we've been quite clear around messaging again on this one. Not everyone will get impacted, but... Um, if you know, obviously, I wouldn't be outside because there's still a lot of debris. So around that um, ten o'clock period tonight, out west, particularly west coast Auckland, you know, brace again. It's going to be a short and sharp change, and if you miss out, awesome. Okay. Yeah, that would be good. Uh, you said quite strong messaging again, and gave me a little smile, I and did. and I, I think that's a little bit of a. Because, well, it's a response to the response to the, the sense that the Met Service didn't warn people enough on Monday and Tuesday. You were very explicit on Checkpoint on, on Tuesday night. You said that Auckland was in for a really unusual night. I did, and I thought we were going to get our bottom spanked or some, something so, similar cacti, to that. I think, yeah. yes. And you talked about the very strong winds that we were going to get, and we didn't fact get. Yes. And Vector were on standby, and Vector are your clients. You yes, clearly warned them. Yes, other power companies, civil defence, etc. And so there were no surprises in the Auckland... But 
infrastructure. So why yeah. didn't people hear those messages? Oh, I mean, our clients get it, and they knew that that was a top end wind, number 130 kilometres an hour plus, and that plus is really important across all of Auckland. You do not see that every day. So we're talking, been six months since the blow, a westerly blow like this, um, and we, we had top end numbers. They all stood up to attention and got ready. I think from a public perception point of view, if you had the Met Service app or went to the website and there's the big red banner saying a you know, wind warning in force for all of Auckland um, and quite a big number in that warning, um, you know, you would have known we were quite serious around that event. But I think a lot of our public messaging gets lost when it's Commonwealth Games and things like that. There was a lot on, a lot going on. Also, as I mentioned, those large national scale views, um, events, you had snow down south and we had gales around and heavy rain and lots of lightning to start. So there was a lot going Going on. Sometimes Auckland does become a little bit lost in the national conversation around severe weather. But of course, we don't handle severe weather very well because we don't get it very often. No, we don't get it very often. And I had a mate in Wellington saying to me, this isn't really severe weather, is it? You know, as a Wellingtonian. Yes. So we do get lots of people saying, are the deck chairs going to fall over Yeah, that's right. Is your barbecue going to topple? <laughs> yes. And so... When Auckland gets a warning that the weather is a severe, big warning, a then big warning, we go down hard. And we have to take that seriously. We have yep. to stop what we're doing and listening. So I'd recommend, in case if you don't know what's going on, or just you know, use the app, use the use the um, the website that's got the big red number and you hit the button, you actually might have to read it or you can come onto our social because we were there saying this will be bad. We're expecting a really significant wind event for Auckland after dark and it was. It was a pretty intense couple of hours there. Uh, lots of power outages. The power companies knew that because they, they have a very good gauge of how much power goes out with different strength wind uh, gusts and they that was a big one for them. They knew, oh dear, well, let's get ready. Um, but I also think you know the damage equation isn't linear, John. What I mean by that is if it had a blow a month ago um, from the same direction, we wouldn't be seeing the damage we saw in Auckland quite so bad. Okay, so it had been five, six months since we'd seen a severe westerly. Okay, so a long time between blows from a particular direction always makes the damage equation worse. Also, um, saturated soils, which we didn't really have in the region this time, makes everything fall over. That's that wasn't the case this time. Um, but also, you know, the bigger the number, the bigger the mess, and that's the key thing. So, just because people don't realise, a hundred and ten kilometre an hour gust makes a mess. Once you get into hundred and twenty, you're looking really widespread for that damage, and then hundred and thirty or hundred and forty for Auckland. Just talking to Auckland here, because Canterbury and Wellington are way better, way more robust we start to see the wheels really fall off. So the bigger the number, and these are small changes in wind gusts, the bigger the number, the bigger the mess. Georgina Griffiths from the Met Service. Uh, just before we move on from Auckland, all southbound lanes of the Southern Motorway temporarily closed from Green Lane due to a police incident. Expect delays from the city, consider alternate route. Boy, that's good advice. If you're about to head to... Um, uh, the south of the city, uh, all southbound lanes temporarily closed from Green Lane. Um, tenants, so we've just got uh, something coming in here. I'm just going to go to our intro. NZTA tweet, southbound lanes on the southern motorway have been closed temporarily by police as they attend an incident on Ellerslie Main Highway overbridge. Please be patient. The thing to do actually would be to avoid that road if you possibly could. And if you're getting onto the motorway at Spaghetti Junction, uh, maybe use Great South or something instead. Let's head from Auckland's traffic to Wellington's buildings. Tenants in a 13-storey commercial building in Wellington CBD have been busy carrying out computers and other equipment this afternoon after being told to evacuate the entire block. Hundreds of tenants were given two hours to evacuate 79 Bullcott Street. The Wellington City Council says the building owners had asked a team of engineers to check it. And after an inspection, the engineers said they were not prepared to certify the building as being safe to occupy. Occupy. Phil Guerin runs a business on the third floor and loaded his car parked on the pavement with computer screens and boxes of belongings. It's been a bit of a shock really. Uh, all the tenants got an email about 2pm to say that uh, engineers doing some extra checks on the building today found some uh, cracks in the floor which appeared to be from when the building was constructed but they couldn't tell whether it would put additional stress on. So they've told all the tenants they have to be out by 4pm today and uh, they don't know when we'll be back in or if we will. Akil Garg works on the 12th floor and says he isn't too worried about the state of the building. The, the building didn't shake so you know <laughs> we guys are good to go but yeah I think it's a process and it always takes time to finish processes so yeah I think it's going to be fine. We don't think so the building is going to get demolished so we are happy about it. 
Mr Garg says tenants have been told they'll find out in the next 48 hours if the building is safe to occupy or not. A roller consultant and management, uh, consultancy and management managed the building. A spokesperson, Melissa McGee, says the building has had cracks on the floor since the late 1970s, but structural engineers have since identified them as concerning. She says tenants were evacuated as a precaution. Uh, so that's Bullcott Street, 79 Bullcott Street. Seemed to happen very suddenly this afternoon, given the cracks have been there since uh, the late 1970s. Uh, we'll update you on any news on the condition of that building as it comes to hand. Let's go back to Washington, where analysts say this could be a disaster for the Republicans, or disasters constantly predicted for the Republicans at the moment, and they seem to be still standing. The Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan, has announced he's stepping down and will not seek re-election in this year's congressional midterms. The Wisconsin congressman says he wants to spend more time with his family. With dozens of Republicans announcing their retirement this year, there are real concerns the Grand Old Party could be in danger of losing the House to the Democrats. The BBC's Nick Bryant has more. Though Washington has grown used to high-profile departures from the White House, the announcement from Paul Ryan that he was retiring as a congressman took the Capitol by surprise. The Republican House Speaker is aged just 48. He's one of America's most powerful politicians. But controlling the fractious Republican caucus has become an increasingly thankless task as the conservative movement has become more radical. And after almost 20 years as a congressman, he intends to spend more time with his young family. You all know that I did not seek this job. I took it reluctantly, uh, but I have given this job everything that I have. And I have no regrets whatsoever for having accepted this responsibility. What I realize is, if I am here for one more term, my kids will only have ever known me as a weekend dad. Uh, I just can't let that happen. Paul Ryan was Mitt Romney's vice president for running mate in the 2012 election. He has long been tipped for high office. But he joins a growing exodus of more than 40 House Republicans who've announced they're leaving Capitol Hill rather than fighting congressional elections in November, at which the Democrats hope to make big gains. Many, like Paul Ryan, have clashed with Donald Trump and felt uneasy about the president's takeover of the Republican Party. Nick Bryant from the BBC. People complaining about hearing about Auckland's weather. Well, there are 20-something thousand homes without power tonight. There may be more. There are as many as 180,000 homes without power early in the week because of a weather event. So I guess that would be news. I am interested. Every time we talk about Auckland at length, people elsewhere in the country complain. But I do want to say that I've done many hundreds of stories, hundreds if not thousands of stories on Christchurch, Poth, Earthquake, Pike River, very particular geographic events. And we don't get the same feedback from Aucklanders saying, oh, why are you talking about, you know, the rest of the country? And I'm a bit concerned or confused or bewildered as to why any conversation of Auckland unleashes a hail of fury. But one in three New Zealanders live here and it does have newsworthy events. It's taking some getting used to, but pole vaulter Eliza McCartney knows she needs to embrace the favourites tag she to, uh, she's, if she's to dominate on the world stage. McCartney burst into international uh, contention when she won a bronze medal at the Rio Olympics two years ago. She heads into Friday's pole vault final as the top-ranked vaulter in the Commonwealth. And despite this being her first Commonwealth Games, she told sports editor Stephen Houston she feels at home. We're hitting good heights and training, really good heights, and um, my technique's come a long way recently, which is super exciting because I never used to be a very good technical vaulter, so it's just awesome now that I can look at my vault and say, hey, that's actually a really good jump. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, even though that 490 was unofficial, I still jumped off the ground and cleared a 4.9 metre bar, and, and that for confidence level is uh, awesome, and I'm confident I will do it again soon. I don't know when, I'm really hoping very soon, but um, that's the thing with pole vault, um, conditions, circumstances, Circumstances, different situations that can um, make it really hard to achieve what you want on the day, but you go out there fighting anyway. And you've made a bit of a change to your run up too. Yeah, well, I'm on a uh, shorter run-up than I wanted to be on at this time, unfortunately, and that was really due to um, the Achilles injury that I had. Um, and I'm one that needs to um, spend a lot of time on my different run-ups to really solidify technique and feel confident and um, capable on those run-ups. And where I am at this time, I'm, I'm on a shorter run-up, but I'm, that doesn't take away from my um, confidence that it will work really well because it's actually what I've jumped my PBs on anyway. So even though it's shorter and I want to go longer straight after these Commonwealth Games, 
gains, I'm, I'm still very happy with where we're at. Longer being, what sort of advantages does that give you? Well, speed really. Um, so um, from our biomechanists we get to see our speed graphs and I'm certainly hitting um, really good speeds um, and where I'm hitting the speeds means that I can go back to longer run-up and hopefully push even faster and that helps you get onto bigger poles and hopefully jump higher. So if I can handle a longer run-up and I can handle the extra speed, then it's a massive benefit, yeah. And uh, Nina Kennedy, mm -hmm. biggest uh, opposition, I mean, presumably, because you go into this pretty much as favourite, which is possibly a little unusual. It is. Yeah, it's completely unusual for me. I've always been the underdog in competitions, <laughs> which I'm very comfortable at. So this is um, such a good opportunity for me to learn to be comfortable with being one of the top people in the in the competition and, and potentially a favourite. And I've got to learn to do that at some point if I want to be on top. So this is a great opportunity. And um, Nina's jumping really well. Alicia Newman um, from Canada, also Holly from um, Britain. They're all jumping well, and so I, um, I can't, I can't afford to just take it easy. I'm, I'm going to be fighting. And you feel a big responsibility, I suppose, for, for pole wall because you've got a big squad here. We do. I, it's just incredible. I, I, I'm just really happy for Jeremy almost more than anybody else because it's the hard work that he's put in, and it shows when he gets three volters here. And I've been training with the uh, with Nick and Olivia for the last few years. I've been training with them a long time, and so to have my teammates as such alongside me here, it just it just makes it more um, special, I think, for us. And, and you're not just out there by yourself. You know, you're out there with with our coach and with other teammates, and with and I'll have Livy out there competing with me, which I've never had a New Zealander out there before. So, all of those things are just awesome. Eliza McCartney, uh, pole vaulter, talking to our sports editor Stephen Hewson, and ending the program for tonight. RNZ News Headlines at 6.30. Vector says there could be delays getting power back for the 25,000 Aucklanders still without it, with another storm expected tonight. Andrew Little will front a public meeting in Taranaki after the government announced an end to new offshore oil exploration. The price of fuel has gone up by three cents due to an increase in the price of crude oil. The Ministry of Education has shut down 23 early childhood centres and put 24 others on notice in 2016. Nurses will be balloted about strike action despite agreeing to an independent panel to resolve their pay row. And mountain bikers Sam Gaze and Anton Cooper have won gold and silver at the Commonwealth Games. Our next news and weather is at 7. Switzerland had some of the highest heroin rates in Europe. That is, until the country decided to destigmatize it. The results in Switzerland have been extraordinary. There have been